Hello and welcome to another episode of the Inspiring Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Pursue Limited, empowering people to flourish across the global education sector by harnessing the power and the potential of coaching. My name is Nicholas Mackay, Professional Certified Coach and Director of Pursue, and I'm going to be your host as we aim to bring you some of the best thinking in education and beyond, gaining insights into inspiring leadership. So let's get straight into today's episode, and I'm delighted to welcome Hannah Rankin, WBA and IBO Super Welterweight World Boxing Champion and Professional Bassoonist. Hannah became the first Scottish female world champion and the only female to headline an event at the Ovo Hydra of Scotland's largest indoor arena. Hannah continues to play the bassoon and also teaches music as well. Hannah, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Um, first of all, congratulations on your recent um, titles. How does it feel to be a, a world champion? Oh, it's amazing. You know, I, when I won the world titles in Tottenham Hotspur down here in London, I, you know, it was an amazing night for me. But being able to go and defend them at, at home in Glasgow in front of, you know, all my Scottish fans was just an, an incredible experience. So, yeah, very, very proud. And there's about four and a half thousand people there, wasn't there? Yeah. Crazy night. <laughs> 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 The crowd that's fantastic so i suppose what i'm quite intrigued by obviously my background is in music and i was a bassoonist and i saw that you were a bassoonist and a boxer so i suppose my first question is around how does that work between music and boxing <laughs> so um when i moved down to london to do my masters at the royal academy of music i um was doing thai boxing at home just for fitness and um i did taekwondo when i was a kid so i've always been drawn back to combat sports for tra training and fitness um and i got um got into the gym here down in london and i met my coach noel callan and he was teaching the boxing classes and again i was just doing it for fitness then and um I just really fell in love with it. It's just, I love the discipline of it. And, you know, all, it, it takes a lot of practice. It's very much like being a musician. Um, so yeah, I like the focus and discipline and I really got into it. I was doing some white collar fights for charity. And then I thought, you know what? I really love this. I want to take it to the next step. And so that's when I turned professional. And all the while I was doing my master's degree at the same time. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, they just worked really well together. Um, and for me, it's, it's all about performance really. At the end of the day, one of them I'm on stage and my bassoon uh, playing with an orchestra or whatever uh, under the lights and hopefully everyone's happy to hear me play Mozart or whatever and on the other hand I'm in the ring under the lights and try not to get punched in the face so it's kind of it's all about performing on the moment so I really enjoy that sort of adrenaline rush. I was, I was going to ask you that I've had a bit of experience playing professionally with the, with the bassoon and you know it I had a couple of auditions where I've been going there my hands have been going a little bit you know and then your breathing goes isn't it when your breathing goes you know oh that's going to be a bit difficult so what are some of the commonalities, I suppose, in terms of performance between being a professional musician at that level and also being a professional boxer? Well, um, one of the things that people don't really know about me is that I used to really struggle a lot with performance anxiety uh, for playing okay. solo. Yeah, for playing solo. So I, I used to really struggle, you know, like you were saying, your hand shaking, the sweating, your heart racing, you can't catch your breath. You know, I used to be really, really nervous. And I was much better with orchestra and chamber music, but it was just mm. the solo stuff. I used to let my mind run away with myself and get really, really nervous and panicky. And so much so in my undergraduate, I actually had to run off stage at one point. I performed amazingly apparently, but I don't remember a minute of it. And then I had to run off stage and I thought I was gonna be sick, you know, I was so nervous. Um, and actually ironically, when I started boxing, and even though it was just white collared for charity at the beginning, boxing put it all in perspective for me. Cause suddenly I realized that people were coming to listen to me play the bassoon and play some beautiful music and they were there to appreciate it they wanted to hear some lovely music whereas with boxing you're on stage you're it's like a stage but you're in a boxing ring and no one's going to punch you in the face when it comes to playing the bassoon you know <laughs> there's no sort of pressure for that there so um i think it kind of just put things in perspective for me and really helped me to start to enjoy being a performer um mm. and you know a lot of the my performance preparation for music is the same as boxing so actually my mental prep is the same i do a lot of visualization um, and i also do a lot of breathing techniques to help control my heart rate these are these are things that cross over really nicely and obviously boxing requires a lot of rhythm which comes from my music side of things so even when i first started boxing my coach he was like well i want you to put that combination to a rhythm in your head so then you can get it right. So you're putting the weight on the right punch for me. And I was like, that's a really good way of thinking about it. And it really kind of 
like clicked in with my mind and how to fix things and how to put it all together. So yeah, no, for me, there's a lot of similarities, but I can totally see why people go, there's nothing the same there. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, that's how, how I think about it. And it's great. There's lots of things that cross over. In terms of visualizations, because we hear a lot about this in sports, you know, especially, I mean, what do you mean by visualization? So for visualization uh, with boxing, obviously, I visualize every possible way that I think the fight could go. I visualize my opponent being an absolute giant and a monster. I visualize it. And over the time during the training camp, I visualize them getting smaller and smaller and more manageable. Um, you know, I visualize getting knocked down in the fight and how I get back up again. But I also visualize how I'm going to win. And I visualize the moment of myself getting my arm raised and uh, the, the referee shout, uh, shouting out that I'm the winner. And I, I visualize that every single day. And it's something that, you know, before this one, so obviously when I won the world titles, it was and the new, and this time it was and still. And every morning, got up and visualized the fight and myself winning, my arm getting raised. And I'd always sit at the side of my bed, raise my arm and go, and still. And that's exactly how I practice it. And so much visualization is so important because the more you do it, when you get into fight night, it becomes more just like you're redoing something you've done a million times before. Mm. Um, and it's such an important tool and a great technique for improving your confidence and helping you to prepare for any sort of stressful situation. And you'd actually physically do that. I'm putting my hand up here. Would you? Oh, yeah, okay. I do. I do it as well when I'm on the treadmill, you know, so the treadmill is kind of like my downtime if I go for a run. That is, I like to put my headphones on, zone out a little bit. But during training camp, I put my headphones on and I visualize the fight and I visualize everything. And I, I often like, you know, I'll put my hand up and I'll be like, that's me winning. And it's that feeling and that feeling it becomes very natural. It's what you expect. Fantastic. And I love the idea of the, the rhythms in terms of those combinations that, that, that you're doing. Can you give me like a, a, an example of what that would look like? Terms, not that I'm an, uh, an official of boxing, but what would that kind of thing that look like? So if you're thinking about like um, a combination, maybe like a double jab cross, but you want the cross to be the more powerful one, you probably accent the cross. So that'd be the accent okay. note in the in the rhythm. So if you're playing it together and you may, maybe make the, the double jab staccato, you know, you make it short that little way of thinking about it. And it's just, it was really clever that my coach managed to think a bit outside the box and, and like lock into something in my mind that was something completely different to what he understands. Mm. But it, it really helped me to learn. And you said that you've had the same coach for your career? Yeah, my whole career. So we, I always say it's from nothing to everything because we, we've literally come from um, a bassoonist that did some boxing for fitness to a uh, two times world champion. So yeah, 17 fights uh, together professionally and maybe six white qualified fights. So yeah, not that many in total, but we, we've done some great things. So, so I suppose in terms of coaching, again, some of the stuff that, that I do a lot, a lot of, in terms of boxing, you know, what do you think makes a good coach? A good coach is somebody that's able to really understand you as a person and also to be able to deal with like, you know, if you can't understand something they're trying to explain to you, they can actually go outside the box and think of another way to show you how to achieve it. Uh, I think that's so important, especially that I have that with my teaching. It's one of my favorite things about teaching. I love to figure out what makes people tick and, and what they enjoy um, because there's a way of getting something across to everybody. It's just some people understand it one way and other people understand it a different way and as a teacher and as a coach you should be able to figure that out oh, that's, that's really interesting isn't it? Again, that link between teaching in terms of teaching how, how much of that do you do now i used to do a lot of teaching but i don't do quite as much anymore just because i can't fit it in with all the training that i've got to do and everything else so um i have a few pupils um one one in particular who i'm particularly proud of because he got into the junior department of the college and you know he's a he's a great little student but um he also just loves his music. He's just very passionate about it. And that's what I enjoy. I enjoy to teach people when they're passionate about something because it's a real pleasure. It's, it's, it's not a chore to teach somebody like that. You know, they just, they just love it. And how often do you play the bassoon nowadays? <laughs> it comes in phases. <laughs> my, my training camps are 10 to 12 weeks. So in, those time, in that time, I cut down the music that I'm doing because I physically just don't have time to practice as much as I want to. So I wouldn't want to take on any extra work or performing work if I, I didn't have the time to practice for it. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've just finished my fight. So we been speaking to my quintet actually this morning. I'm hoping to get some more work in. We do a lot of work with a company called Live Music Now. And okay. they take music into schools and uh, into care homes. 
and it's, it's a really great part of my job that I actually really enjoy so fingers crossed we'll have some gigs coming up. Fantastic is that the, the same quintet that you had at Music College or is it people that you met afterwards? Um, Yes, we all met together at, um, at the Royal Academy of Music, so it's the Coriolis Quintet. So we have a great group of us and we like to do lots of different different things, but we really like the interactive con concerts because it means you get like a real feedback from the audience. Um, and often like the one thing about kids is that they're very honest <laughs> and that's what I appreciate the most. You know, they're very honest and saying, I don't like that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it keeps you on your toes. You have to be very uh, creative and, you know, because children's attention span, like young children, the attention span is not always that long. So you can't go off on something for a 20 minute movement of a piece because uh, they're just going to drift off. <laughs> it has to be exciting for them and something they enjoy listening to. It's, it's very, how do you find uh, music college? So it's a really funny thing because when I started my undergraduate, I think like every other undergraduate uh, that was playing a musical instrument wanted to be an orchestral musician. We yeah. all want to have a job in an orchestra. That's what we all think we want to do. Um, and actually the thing about the most difficult thing about being a musician is actually you need a portfolio. You need to be able to do loads of different things. So you can have a quintet or some chamber group. You have to do orchestral playing. Now you might focus on Baroque or you might be more into your opera and, um, you know, it just depends. And then, of course, you've got all the teaching side of things. Are you doing one on one lessons? Are you in a school? Are you doing group lessons? Um, are you able to actually go in and teach um, en masse for whole classes? So as a musician, it's very it's that like you go in with the dream of just being an orchestral musician, but actually you have to do so much more to actually be a musician as a whole. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a strange one. It's so specialised. In some respects, look, looking back, and as I mentioned before, we started recording, I went to Trinity College of Music, which at that time was down the road from the Academy. So we had to go yeah. to the World Academy for to have a few drinks, etc. Um, those were the days. Um, but um, in, in, in terms of special, specialism, all my friends were kind of doing different things, meeting different people, having different experiences. And, you know, it was very serious very quickly, I found, in terms of music college. Definitely. I think because it is so specialised and, you know, it's sort of like the elite level of playing that you have to be at already when you just start your first year, because the competition is so high to get into a place like that. You know, um, I was the only one in my year that went to the Royal Academy of Music that got in for that that year. So for my master's and it's just one of those things where you you don't really think about it until it's later on when you leave and you think actually I was a group of a very small number of students that were given places to work in these uh, work in these schools and um, I think one of the hardest things is the pressure as well to deal with because especially as a bassoonist and you'll know this is like if you're playing principal it's all on you when it comes to so it comes to the solo in the orchestra and um, if you're a string player you can be a rank and file string player but as a wind wind player you are a, a soloist and that's how it is so there's a lot of pressure from right from the very very beginning um but i think you know i th i thrive under pressure and it's one of those things as i've got older i've really come to appreciate it more uh, especially with my boxing one of the phrases i always say is, is pressure is a privilege and you wouldn't feel under pressure if you didn't do something great if you weren't doing something where other people were thinking I want to be like that I wish I could do that so when you feel pressure it's it's a privilege to feel it because other people think that you're doing amazing things and I think it's a good way of thinking about it and it sort of helps when you're starting to feel oh there's all this stuff happening and everything's getting on top it, it's a privilege and it's, it's a good way of kind of controlling it I suppose you know we hear a lot about stress nowadays and people kind of coming away from stress I suppose with what, what you do, you actually walk towards that stress in terms of, you know, working your body, potentially getting hit, these kind of things. So how do you prepare yourself for that? So I think the mental training side of things is really, really important. Obviously, physically, you need to be fit. And, and one of my things has always been that I will not be outworked. And I won't be out work to, whether I'm doing something with my bassoon, whether I'm doing something that's a, a public speaking event or anything like that. I'll never be underprepared and I won't be outworked because I think you can achieve so much yourself before you even ha have any expectations put on you. Um, and your own expectations should be the highest for yourself, I think, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things that you need to do mentally prepping yourself for the whole occasion and um, being aware of what you need to achieve before you actually get there. Because for me, obviously, at world, world title level, there's a lot more that comes with that. 
So there's a lot more, um, you know, media work. <laughs> and often when you're getting ready to fight, you're, you're coming down to a particular weight, you're grumpy, <laughs> you're, you're hungry, um, and, you know, your body's a bit sore, you've been working really, really hard. So you've just got to learn how to speak in front of a camera um, and also be aware of the fact that you're probably going to be a little bit short-tempered. <laughs> so just to be a bit more patient with yourself. Um, and also you know, be aware that there's going to be a public workout. People are going to be wanting to take photos of you. And it, for me, when I had my last fight, I had this amazing situation where I had a public workout in St. Enoch Centre in Glasgow. And I had people from all different backgrounds, all different places, from all ages, right down from like four or five year olds, all the way to your grandparents, wanting to take photos, wanting to come and talk to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to take it all in because it's an incredible feeling. But Mentally, I knew it was going to be a busy week and I prepared myself for that by actually going through it in my mind. I was like, right, this is what we're doing. This is what I'm going to do. I have everything written down. I have a training diary. That's how I do it. I suppose a bit of a personal question here, Hannah, but you know, what's driving you to do this? So I think for me, like, I was very unfortunate to lose my mum uh, when I started my master's here in London. Um, I came down for my first term, got home, and she actually got diagnosed with cancer. And six months later, she passed away. It was really, really sudden. Um, and to be honest, my mum was one of my best friends. She was my biggest hero. She was my biggest critic. <laughs> she was the first person to tell me that I was doing amazingly with my music, but the first one to tell me when it could have been better, you know, and I appreciated that. Um, my mom was really young so we were actually quite close in age um and you know when she passed away it was just a huge huge like i don't know loss for me um in my life in all angles um and when i when when you lose somebody it changes you it gives you a different sort of perspective on things it makes you think well for me anyway it made me think i'm only going to be here for as long as i'm here so i want to put as much as i can do into everything that i'm doing um so at that time boxing was really important to me it was there like I had a family in the gym that were not associated with my own family mm -hmm. and I think sometimes when you're going through grief it, it's sometimes good to have a different different people around you because mm -hmm. they're not associated with memories and, and things that you, you will might potentially upset you and also boxing gave me that sort of outlet for my frustration and my anger and it was like you know when I worked out in the bag it was like that one split second where I could feel like I was so tired I couldn't think about anything so because boxing was there that time, I felt, you know, it gave me everything I need, everything I needed to help support me. And so for me now is that I want to give everything back to it. And I want to show that it doesn't matter what age you fall in love or with a passion, get a passion for something that you can go and follow that dream. Everyone thought I was crazy. Hannah's going professional in her twenties in a brand new, in a sport that she never even did as a kid, you know? So for me, it was all about giving back to something that was there for me in a really difficult time and seeing how far I could go. Because like, like I said, I, I, you don't know how long you're going to be here for. So you might as well make the most of it. Thank you for being so, so honest there. I you know, really appreciate it. Um, I suppose in terms of your um, training camps, you said 10 to 12 weeks. Sounds a bit brutal to me. So, <laughs> so kind of what goes into that then? Well, obviously, being at championship level you need more time for these things and uh, you don't fight as regularly as you might have done when you first started out so I was known for being a very active fighter you know for three to four times a year um so but now as a, as a world champion it's maybe twice a year <laughs> maybe three if I'm lucky <laughs> but it's more too um and you know that comes with other things as well like you know the costs of, of fighting for a world title as well uh, i've got two now uh, finding opponents at the right level at the right time um and big venues and, and big occasions so all of these things you, your promoter has to take into account as well so there's a bit more time but yeah 10 to 12 weeks is I, that's my actual camp time i have a pre-camp where i get my body into shape uh it's not really into shape it's more kind of strengthening certain things like little weaknesses that i want to work on with my body um and stuff that my strength and conditioning uh snc kind of uh guy is giving me stuff for as has my coach and little tech uh, we will use the time to build on technique for the ring as well but during the actual camp time you're you're training six days a week twice a day 
um, and two lots of that tend to be for sparring so you know sparring with fighting with other people practice basically what you call practice fighting um so because you need to practice these things before you get in there um so there's that and i do a lot of traveling for that and when i started out there was just wasn't that many females in the uk um, so I traveled abroad. I used a lot of my own kind of savings to take myself abroad to help myself get as much experience as possible. Um, now I choose when I need to travel, you know, for certain things or I bring people here, uh, which is a, a nice uh, situation to be in. Um, and also during that time, I'll have cardio. Obviously, I do sprints and running. That all needs to be done. Uh, and I do stuff on the walk bike that I was telling you about this morning. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't as brutal as it normally is. <laughs> pretty much chilled as far as I was concerned <laughs> um, and then bags and pads and technique work with your coach so it is full on and of course the diet comes into part of that as well so and the recovery side of it so th there's a lot to do when you're a full-time athlete it sounds it and your weight is welterweight is that right super welter for that super well so is it easy to kind of go up and down weights in boxing so it's a bit different for girls. So we tend to fluctuate a lot more between the weights because there's less of us and the opportunities come up over the different weights. So whereas the guys tend to, there's more of them. So they can stay at their weight, work their way up. Um, whereas for me, I, I, I box at all different weight classes. I've been at welter, super welter, middle, super middle. I'm not big enough to be a middleweight. Uh, you know, and I fought that way, but I'm just really not big enough. And the super middle was a, a one-off situation. It was actually my first chance fighting for a world title, first time in America. So I, this is a big thing that I'm a massive uh, fan of, is that you take opportunities when they come up, because you never know where you're going to go. So, like, I've done loads of crazy things. I've gone to some amazing places. But that one, when I took that fight, it was my first time in America. I started to build an American fan base. Uh, people started to know a little bit more who I was. The, the fight was meant to be on Fox Sports, but the ironic situation was during, at that time, women's boxing wasn't really that popular. So they they got to the women's fight and they turned the cameras off and said, people don't want to watch women's boxing. And we were the only title fight on the card. It was crazy. But um, yeah, no, so I've gone between the weight classes, but now I'm really, truly, I can box super welterweight. It's my division. It's where I'm world champion. Um, I could drop down to welterweight as well, but it does depend, obviously, on situations and opportunities that come up. I suppose in, in terms of uh, female boxing, you know, everyone speaks about the Katie Taylor, isn't it? And the, the fight that we've recently had and the exposure everyone's getting and you getting four and a half thousand people at Scotland's biggest indoor arena. You know, are we at a place now where things are changing in relation to your sport? Absolutely. This is the most exciting time to be a female boxer, I personally think. And mm -hmm. the fact that I'm at the forefront of that change is, is incredible. It's so exciting. And um, like you said, the Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano fight at Madison Square Garden was incredible. You know, like they sold it out. They were the main event. It was like the first million dollar payday for women. It was it was great. And then two weeks later, I made history in Scotland, uh, you know, headlining a massive arena at home. And for that to happen within like a three week period, it's just, it was, would have been completely unheard of. Like a woman headlining a stadium, mad, mm. you know? Uh, whereas now it's, it's really taken a huge step forward. And ironically, I have to thank the pandemic for that because as I keep saying to people, I'm like, during the pandemic, we had a captive audience sitting at home. They had nowhere else to go. <laughs> um, and suddenly Matchroom and Sky Sports decided they were going to put on some women's fights in the garden when Eddie was running those shows. So, it, but it wasn't just any old fights, they were world title fights. So they were really high level, exciting matchups. And people didn't have an excuse to not watch it. So often mm. it used to be when you were at the boxing, um, you know, we'll go to the boxing and the guys would be like, oh, it's a chick's fight, we'll go to the bar. Standard <laughs> statement. <laughs> but, now, but now it's like people sitting at home and they're like, oh, actually, really enjoying this because it's, it's fast, it's two minute rounds, high paced. Um, and we were just so excited to have the opportunity to be on TV that we all delivered. All of the girls that fought during the pandemic, you know, we just put on a show because we were like, this is our chance. This is, this is how we're gonna do it. And we all just put on amazing fights and everyone was talking about it. Uh, and suddenly as well, like we've, we've got a lot more people who like, uh, you know, from the female side supporting it. So you've got lots of young girls now following it. Uh, mums, uh, aunties, they're all like into it. I wanna watch the women's fight. That's, I'm gonna watch the boxing tonight, you know, and that's unheard of. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's been a real change around for us and I, it's only going to increase now and only going to get better. 
you get a, a lot, lots of uh, young, younger um, people, maybe girls, maybe even boys, whatever, you know, fan mail and getting hold of you and saying what an inspiration you are, etc. Yeah, I do. I, I do get a lot of messages, which is really, really nice. And actually, it was one of the strangest things when I went over into the boxing world because I've never experienced that sort of thing before. And, and people telling me, you know, oh, you're my daughter's favourite boxer. And I was thinking, this is mad. People know who I am. <laughs> it just was really, really crazy. But it's also nice to get messages from parents to say, you know, you're inspiring my children and they're getting involved in the sport and you've really helped increase their confidence and mm -hmm. just little things like that. Because for me, what I want my legacy to be in the sport is, is just that. I want to inspire the younger generation to get involved in this sport. I also want to inspire anybody to get involved in boxing because like I said, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can do anything you want to do. You just need to follow it and get some support and, you know, trust yourself because usually you're the best person to make that decision <laughs> um, and boxing is a great way to stay fit you don't have to actually do any sort of physical fighting just the fitness side of it is incredible um and funny a funny story so yesterday i was actually speaking on the bbc sports sound in scotland and i had to get a taxi to the studio <laughs> and i got off the train station i got to the taxi and the guy was like hello champ how are you doing <laughs> I didn't know he knew me and he was like, oh, I'm following you my my son's got really into boxing um, and he was so excited he's like it's been a huge step and the whole family are really into boxing now we're all keeping super fit I've lost loads of weight and I just didn't realize I'd had that sort of impact on people and it, it was a really proud moment actually if not surreal but very proud <laughs> I'm sure you're getting more of that now, aren't you? Now, now, you know, you're a household name more with, with boxing people will be stopping you you know getting an autograph that, those kind of things yeah, uh, he asked me for a selfie. <laughs> there you are, yeah, also got old fashioned, but yeah, yeah, selfie. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that is happening a lot more, and it still surprises me because, you know, I'm just Hannah. And I'm a little girl from a tiny little village called Luss in Scotland. And I grew up in the middle of nowhere on a sheep farm. And, and now people are like, hey, Hannah, it's so nice to meet you. Can we get a picture? And I'm just like, this is mad. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a real pleasure. And I, I'm glad that people, you know, feel... That's the other thing. I want people to always feel like they can just come and talk to me because I'm just like anybody else. You know, I just 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 come and say hi. And that's one of the most important things, I think, because if you if you become a role model as a sports person and all sport like people who are at the top of their game, that they are technically they fit the, the the category of role model. But it's how you perform and how you act about it. That's so important. And, and I think for me, when I was a kid, like there weren't that many female role models especially mm. in sport like not that many at all so it wasn't as easy to access them or speak to them or you know follow their journey or anything so nowadays it is so I always feel like I say to people just just drop me a message you have any questions say hi I don't mind you know it's not a problem who's your sporting role model uh, Venus and Serena Williams they're legends absolute legends <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, those two are incredible but also somebody actually probably my peers uh laura muir uh she's a scottish runner a long distance runner and and she's incredible i've never seen anybody suddenly pull out this like eighth gear when she's on the track it, it's just phenomenal to watch so those are the kind of people that inspire me yeah and especially in terms of next steps for you in your boxing career hannah you know is there a unification fight these kind of things coming up so obviously i've got two of the five belts at my weight I want to have all five. <laughs> that, that's my goal. <laughs> I don't think any other uh, world champions are going to ever sit there and say they don't want the other ones. Uh, no, I want the other ones. Um, that's my focus. I want to unify the division. Um, I even want to potentially become a two-weight world champion. You know, So these are all options that I'm thinking about and working hard towards. And you know, my next, uh, looking towards the next fight, September, October time, either Scotland or London, because obviously I've been in London 11 years. It's like my second home. So I feel like I should share my time. <laughs> some in Scotland, <laughs> some down here. Um, and yeah, we, we shall see what's happening next. But we've got some, my, my team, my promotional team, has something penciled in for diary. So yeah, now I'm just getting ready, working towards uh, hopefully unifying at some point. It's easy to do that because you look at other, I'm thinking about Tyson Fury now and Anthony Joshua, and it's always difficult to get people to you know, unify the division, isn't it? Is it you know, how difficult is it to do that? So I think it's the one difference between male and female boxing is that there's less of us and 
it's we are on the women's side we're much more inclined a bit like the UFC to have the best fight the best much more right. regularly that happens it just the turnaround is a lot more common than it is in the guys the guys they kind of move around each other oh we're not doing we're not fighting this time yeah it never, it never happens is it no but the difference is is that they make enough money to not have to mm. and and that is one of the main issues is that you you know it's an incredible thing where Devin Haney, he's just unified over in um, Australia against uh, uh, Cambosis, right? He's, he's got the ring magazine, but he's got all the belts. <laughs> um, and, you know, like he's leaving in his private jet. You know, when a girl unifies the division, there's no private jets. Yeah. <laughs> That's not, we, we just don't get paid anywhere near the same as what the guys do for at world title level. It's just not the same. Um, so that's something that, you know, I'm pushing for. I'm pushing for purses to be raised because at the end of the day, I do just as much hard work as the guys. I bleed the same. I sweat the same. I'm at risk of injury just the same as they are. Um, and the only difference you can argue is that we do two minute rounds and they do three minute rounds. And my argument is we should still be allowed to do three minute rounds or at least 12 twos. But, you know, that's another argument for another day. But at the end of the day, we're both putting ourselves at risk for the sport that we love. So we should all be equally paid. Fantastic. And as I always ask some of my, my guests some questions here about maybe going back to I suppose um, the start of your career and, and, and any advice that, that you'd give yourself. I think the advice to give myself is to stop trying to be like other people. Uh, and I think that's a, a thing that we do in any part of our careers or any, anything we choose to do, even at school. Um, we desperately want to fit in and we want to be like everybody else so we don't stand out. But actually, you know, because when I first started, I didn't come from an amateur background. Uh, so I was never going to look like an amateur boxer, but I was desperate to look like them and, and be like them. But suddenly, as I went through my early stages of my career, I realized actually I was pretty happy being myself. And uh, my own style is my own style and nobody else has got Hannah's style. So, you know, it just took it took me a little bit longer to accept that and actually start to appreciate what I was good at instead of trying to be like everybody else. I think that's probably my best bit of advice I would give my earlier self, <laughs> give myself a lot less stress. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Just before we, we, we go, what, what bassoon have you got? <laughs> I've got a Fox. Me too. Yeah, Fox 601. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get super geeky. <laughs> yeah, um, fantastic. Um, I'm super attached to it. It's like the one thing that, uh, like you know it sits beside my world titles and the two of them are very equally loved so yeah <laughs> do you, when, so i see a belt in the background there do, do you have a uh, have you like your world titles on you know display in your bedroom or in your, in your house or? yeah so i i have all my belts um i'm looking to get a new uh stand to actually keep them all in so that they can all just sit there nicely uh because they come in these amazing big uh silver metal boxes that look like you know you're carrying some serious gear inside <laughs> them you know but it's they're so heavy to travel around with and you know i just want to put them in a nice stand and keep them there looking shiny and pretty um i look at them every morning just to go yeah they're mine <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's the one. laughs> fantastic well thanks again i really appreciate you know, making time to coming on thanks for, for being so honest and, and reflective as well really appreciate it no thank you so much for having me it's been a great chat it's been really good um many thanks to hannah um in this series, we are proud to once again be in partnership with Independent School Management Plus, an international school magazine, the leading authority and voice for professionals in independent and international education worldwide. So if you'd like to watch the video of today's podcast, please head over to schoolmanagementplus.com. And if you're interested in partnering with Pursue through our suite of individual team and school-wide coaching culture awards, please send me an email at hello at pursue.com or visit our website pursue.com. Bye for now. Take care and look forward to speaking to you again soon.